Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Uh, we're using the same notes we had last week, kind of talking about does God exist or is, is there a God? And it's a, it's a fair question. It's a question that should be asked and should be answered. And uh, it is uh, possible to come to a logical conclusion. We are not in a position where we're just by faith, like we believe in Tinkerbell or something. You've got to believe. You've got to believe. It's like... There is evidence, there's logical evidence. And here's four of the classical arguments, the cosmological, teleological, the moral, and ontological arguments. Again, those are big words, we'll describe them. Uh, we are on uh, page, uh, page three, looking at this first one, the cosmological argument. And that's where we began last week, getting into what I like a lot is the Kalam, K-A-L-A-M, uh, argument that you see on page five that just talks about we have a creation, the very fact that we are in a creation, that we live in this reality, it's got time, it's got space, it's got matter. Now when we start talking about the fact that we have self-awareness, that we have self-consciousness, and that we're looking for some kind of truth and there's morals, that gets more into this kind of an area here. But in cosmological, we're talking more about the, the fact that we exist. And we see on page five in review, uh, these simple questions, and this was come up, this was brought, brought together, uh, building on some of the Greek philosophy, put together by Islam, and then picked up again and developed further by with Thomas Aquinas. Uh, but again, Islam and, and uh, Judaism and Christianity are all theistic religions where we believe there is a God who is, is uh, transcendent, he's outside of his creation, but he also intervenes and is involved in creation. So there's a certain place where Islam and Judaism and Christianity walk stride for stride when compared to atheism or deism or different things like this. But then you start defining who is your God, uh, that begins to separate the crowd. But nonetheless, uh, the universe exists. Was there a beginning? And so, you know, one option is no. There was no, no beginning. It existed forever, but that's uh, impossible because it, it's it's happening. Time is taking place, and it had a beginning. Even science proves that. And Islam decided that long ago. Uh, and yes, there was a beginning, so now was the universe caused? It had a beginning. Was it caused, or was it accidental? Well, it's, the logic is it's impossible for something to be caused without a cause. Everything has a cause, and so the answer would be yes, it had a cause. Well, if it had a beginning, it had a cause that caused it. What was the cause? Uh, it could be a random directionless force. It had no thought, no mind, it just this force just blew through and we got all of this order, this creation. Well, you can't have this order uh, from a random force. There has to be, if we're going to have order, we live in a world of order. We, we ourselves are orderly. We, we have bodies that function, a universe that functions. So the answer would be it had to be some kind of a personal agent, someone that had a plan had the ability to organize. So we've got, there was a beginning, there was a cause, the cause was a personal agent. What was that agent like, the, you know, talking this, this being? Uh, it's limited to the universe. It was just confined to the universe itself. Something in the universe caused the universe, well, that's illogical, it caused the universe to have order. Well, it, it, something's gotta be outside the universe. To cause the universe and bring order into the universe, there has to be a force we're talking about originally. Now, there can be forces within the universe that rebuilds and, and, you know, like seasons come and seasons go. But the original had to be outside. So the agent had to be separate from the universe. The creator would have to be intelligent, powerful, timeless, capable of choice, immaterial, because he's going to create material, and causeless. And then, of course, there's three religions that have this. Uh, that would be Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. The religions that are illogical in this Kalam theory, uh, this image, and they are illogical. I mean, you can say, well, we want to respect them. Indeed, respecting something, there are people that are illogical, but you still respect them. There are philosophies that are illogical, but people are free to believe them. And these religions are basically idol religions because they're worshiping something in creation, causing creation to have come from itself. They're not looking at the true God, and that would be Buddhists, Hindus, and many ancient religions that are based in, if it's polytheism. So that's kind of this cosmological argument. It co continues there with this discussion on page five, with point four at the bottom of page five. Thomas Aquinas, 
This was during the age when we went through church history. We talked about the different ages. There's a scholastic age right around, you know, 11, 1200, 10, 1000 uh, AD when everything became very, very scholastic. They began to ask all kinds of questions and they began uh, uh, as far as writing and intellectual thinking. And Thomas Aquinas was one of the masters of this. Again, he was Catholic, okay? So, I mean, any Christian in, you know, 1000 AD, 1200 AD, they're going to be Catholic. Uh, Thomas Aquinas took this one step further by addressing the need for a cause of the universe uh, current existing. And that's where we talked about last week. We got into that a little bit about music. Uh, there, the music is not just created, but with the music's playing, there has to be a music creator. You can't just create music and then stop. If you're going to create music, you have to continue to play. So the fact that the universe exists is one thing, but Thomas Aquinas began to talk about the fact that the universe continues to exist, meaning the creator didn't just start it and walk away. He's continuing to play the music to keep this creation going. And that makes sense. It lines up with the Bible. We looked at some verses uh, last week. Uh, talking about in, in Psalms and Hebrews. Uh, and so that's, so, yeah, that's the, the cosmological argument. Basically, we've got this system. Now, the tele, teleological argument. This is a design. And again, some of these things begin to overlap, but this is a different idea here. Uh, design argument. It, it's use of design, purpose, and order of the universe as proof for the existence of God. It's from the Greek word telos, which means end or goal or purpose. So this right here, uh, teleo. We can see this in uh, even in the Greek text when we talk about you know the word perfection. But nonetheless, it means there's an end, there's a purpose, there's a design. It's it's going somewhere. It's not just here, but there's some plan. And again, sometimes we do not understand the plan uh, in the big sense. But even now, we understand the plan for uh, you know the environment. You know the, the reason we've got different animals. They're in the food chain. The reason we've got different seasons. It's for a cycle. And so the ideal here is there is an end, there is a goal. Uh, the contemporary teleological argument in today's wor world, uh, the design and teleological argument is supported with scientific details such as these things. And, and these are things that have come up recently. We start talking about, you know, intelligent design, ID. They call it ID. And some in some of the scientific world, some, are, they mock this intelligent design because they see it as another word for God. And it is, in a sense, a code word for God. Because if you're talking atheism, you're talking evolution, you're talking just chance. When things just came out of nowhere. And then you get some explanation for that. But if you say, well, we believe in intelligent design, intelligent means there was some kind of a mind Design means there is some kind of a plan or a purpose. Intelligent design is screaming a person, you know, not a not a human being, but some kind of a being that exists that can think. I mean, you are just one word away from saying God. And so the scientific world doesn't like intelligent design, but the fact that the scientific world has been continued to prove or discover some kind of design and having to default to the fact that some intelligent form. They'll go with, you know, uh, alien life came here and created this. They'll go to multiple universe trying to explain it, but there is intelligent design here. And that's why we talk about Anthony Flew. He came out of the atheistic camp and came into the deist camp because he says, no, there is a God. I mean, it, it, you can't have this. It's illogical to think that there is no, and again, this is, he's a philosopher. That was his conclusion. Is my conclusion also, but this is called intelligent design. Today they call it intelligent design, but it's based on the teleological argument that there is a purpose. And so here are some points. Number one, the fine tuning of the universe, such as is described by philosopher Robin Collins. Again, this information is things I've been reading books and pulling it out of books. And what I when I study this, I what I, I'm so tempted, I, I don't know how I would do it because it's not, it would, you know, it would not need a class. It becomes kind of some kind of a book club. And I, I read books, it's like, instead of teaching this book, I'm just going to buy books and give them to you, and then we're going to just get together, and you're just going to, we're going to read these chapters, and then, I don't know, come together and talk about it. You know, it's kind of like when now comes some kind of a Sunday school class. You read your chapter in your book. So, you know, I, I can give you the list of books, but, you know. What I'm, so what I'm saying is, I, I read these books, and it's like, this is the, besides just buying a book and giving it to you, say, read the book, 
this is the next step is I'm not having you buy the book. I'm trying to read the book and just spit out some information. So Robin Collins quote says, when scientists talk about the fine tuning of the universe, they're generally referring to the extraordinary balancing of the fundamental laws and parameters of physics and the initial conditions of the universe. The initial conditions of the universe. Our minds can't comprehend the precision of some of them. In other words, what that's now you and me, we, we're just common citizens going about our day. But when the scientists go out there and they go through all this training and they go out there and they look and they get and look at it, it's like we can't even understand, we don't even, can't even explain this. And they come back just like, now we, we couldn't even understand it. Like if you look at you know mathematical problems, I just see a bunch of numbers, I don't even understand it. It's it's a foreign language. And for me to see some of these things, which is I, I couldn't, I don't know what I'm looking at. Should I be impressed? I don't understand it. These people understand it and they go look at it and it's like, oh my gosh. They know what they're looking at. They're looking at something beyond their understanding and it's complicated. And that's what he's saying here. Our minds can't comprehend the precision of some of them. Now this is Robin Collins, the philosopher talking. It's not me. If he can't understand it, I mean, just think about you know the average middle school shop teacher. The result is a universe that has just the right conditions to sustain life. The coincidences are simply too amazing. It's not one coincidence. It's coincidence after coincidence after coincidence. Now, three or four would be amazing, but you just got a whole string of coincidences starting somewhere back in the past that are still continuing today. This, this is not possible without some kind of purpose. Someone had a plan that put this in motion. The coincidences are simply too amazing to have been the result of happenstance. And that's from the evidence of physics, and you can see the reference there. Now again, understand, you go back to the 1800s, and you're, you're coming out before the scientific age has begun, but there's so many things we have yet to learn, that you can throw out things like evolution, Darwinism, and, and certain ideas, and everybody's going to say, well, we can't argue with that. Well, science has progressed 120, 150 years since then, and they've tried those theories. They've, they've gone off to try and prove that these things are right. As they go out to try, find evidence to prove they're right, they find things too big to explain, say, no, that means this philosophy, this theory of evolution, is it, it doesn't stand up. There's something else. And so the intelligent design is gaining ground every day. And, and people realize the next one. The irreducible complexity, which refers to the fact that there are systems in biological life that consist of several interlocking parts that must be in place before they can function at all. This is, the point of this is, uh, the, the, is there's a, the ideal of evolution. That things began in the simple form. And they, they began, you know, you start off with a, and again, if we're in the 1800s, there's this cell, that's alive, very simple, simple cell. And it, it then splits into two cells. Now we're going to put billions of years behind this, and then it's going to split into more cells, and this is just taking place and splitting, and then it begins to adapt to its environment, it begins to sense light, and now there's an organism up here that's got some kind of light sensing, it, it goes towards light, and that's going to eventually evolve into the eye on the human or an animal. It's like, oh, wow, you know, amazing. Okay, now we come down here. This is not the way, this is not the way it happened. Let's just start with this. Now we look at the cell. Within that cell are so many complex moving parts that make this cell function that this is multi who whenever that first cell, if there was a first cell, it was already too complicated to have just existed. It was already designed this is, com more, this is way more complicated than they thought in the 1800s. And that's what we're talking about, meaning there are systems already set in place in this cell that it couldn't just have evolved. And for example, the eye, the, the, many times they use the eye as an example, is the eye, there's no way the eye could have just evolved over a long period of time. The eye has features in it that have to be there originally for it to function. It can't just grow and produce naturally. It's got to be designed. The eye did not, the eye, this is a shop teacher telling you what I've read in books, the eye cannot evolve. The eye, for example, 
had to be designed and put in place. It had, it, it, there's not enough, you can't scale it back, you can't reverse engineer it and see how it all came together. The only thing you see is that someone built the eye. There it was. And that is that what this point is. And this is not, this is not so, uh, 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 the, uh, 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 the, I don't want to say theory, I'm thinking of theology. This is not a wish list. This is not what we see in the book of, of Psalms, you know, that David talks about being woven together in his mother's womb. We're not talking about Bible verses or theory or theology. We're talking about scientists who went off to prove this and they found this that had to be complex when it started. It's like, this doesn't work. And that's why there aren't any Darwinists today. There's Neo-Darwinists. They had to rework the system. And now they're coming up with ideas such as, you know, it, who is this, who, who created this? And that's why they're willing to, the very fact that they're willing to say alien life started this. Because they've got to embrace intelligent design. They don't want God. They want alien life. Or just the multiple universe. There's just so many, you don't understand, there's so many universes. Well, now you're trying to explain God without saying God. And here we go, we read more. Similar to how a computer operates. And Bill Gates got in on this discussion. I'm not sure if I've got a quote from him coming up here. Similar to how a computer operating, a computer operating system must be fully created and installed before it will function. Now, if you know anything about computers, and I, I use computers, but I'm no by no means an expert on computers, but I do know that if I upload a program, it's all, I download the program and it functions. But if I get in there and I start moving stuff around, I get into a file I should be and I delete something accidentally, the whole program is corrupted. It's like I changed one thing and the whole program no longer works. It's got to be up and running. So computer programs don't evolve. They've got to be designed and then downloaded. Don't mess with it, and it will work. You start pulling parts out, it starts to malfunction, starts to freeze up, it starts to, you know, do a, it becomes a virus. Similar to how a computer operating system must fully be fully created and installed before it will function. The argument demonstrates that that this irreducibility complete system could not have come about gradually, but in incremental changes but must have been given all at once. That's the key. It came all at once. Even Charles Darwin, now this is great right here. Even Charles Darwin himself admitted in his book, The Origin of Species in chapter 6, quote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications my theory would absolutely break down. Charles Darwin quoted in his book, he is basing it on this idea that every, every phase can grow out of the previous phase. He says if you can find something that cannot exist through this process of evolution, I, I, it's, you know, I've, I've been defeated completely. Well, we have. Not, not, it's not the Christians, although the Christians are on board, it's the scientists out working with Charles Darwin's theory, finding things. It's like, uh, Charles, uh, this can't happen, like you said. It's already functioning at a high level when it begins. And so that's, that's that point right there. Information theory refers to the fact that the DNA of biological life forms, uh, bio, biological life forms contains information encoded at the molecular level. So we're talking about in the molecular level, there are things coded in that didn't evolve. They were coded in to cause this thing to happen. Because information always arises from intelligence, there must be an intelligent source of the DNA information. Proponents, here's a quote from Walter Bradley on page 7 at the top, from Walter Bradley, a mechanical engineer, and Charles Thaxton, a biochemist, from their book, Proponents of an Intelligent Origin of Life Note that molecular biology has uncovered an analogy between DNA and language. The genetic code functions exactly like a language code. Indeed, it is a code, the DNA. It is a molecular communication system, a sequence of chemical letters 
stores and transmits, a, a, a sequence of chemical letters stores and transmits the communication in each living cell. So you've got a language. This cell, if Charles Darwin did have the original cell, there is a language that is functioning that is sending signals within that through that, that storing, uh, like it says, and transmitting communication every cell, and it can have just evolved. Uh, again, it used to be a very simple cell. Now we find out it's much more complex. That is the teleological argument. The classical tell that's the modern phase of it. The, on the next point on page seven, the classical teleological argument, uh, going back like you go back to Thomas Aquinas and, and through the Middle Ages and before that, focuses on the abstract concepts such as being, time, cause, and space. So what I just showed you is basically the results of intelligent design of course, supported by Christianity and, and you know, their desire to prove that the, 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 their theology is correct, but also supported by scientists that are looking at it. Now we go back to before that was all done, we would have things that focus on the being of a person or being or existence, uh, time, cause, and space. And this is the things that you go back to Thomas Aquinas, the Middle Ages before, even you know, before Darwin. And Darwin, of course, was trained as a theologian. He went to theology school. Uh, this would have been something that they would have understood. In, his, in this thought process, there are four kinds of causes. Material causes, formal cause, efficient cause, and final cause. The material cause means out of which the effect is. For example, wood nor a formal cause which an effect is. For example, a structure, a chair. You have wood. The wood then formed a chair. The efficient cause by which an effect is, for example, the carpenter. It, you have the wood. That's a cause. Then the, you have a chair. That's what the wood became. But who made the wood into a chair? That's the carpenter. And the final cause for which an effect is, for example, why was it? Why is a chair a chair? What's a chair? Why did you build a chair? Because people need to sit. So you've got those three levels. You've got the material. You've got the material being formed into something else. That's a cause. And there's something happening. But who did the work? The carpenter. And now the carpenter designed a chair out of wood. Why would he do that? Because he needed a chair. So those are some material cause, formal cause, or cause, efficient cause, and final cause out of which, which, by which, and for which. Uh, the cosmological, ontological, and teleological argument right here, you've got them written down here again. Uh, cosmological argument reasons from existence of the cosmos to a creator. The ontological argument argues from the concept of a necessary being to that of the being's existence. The moral argument argues from the moral law to the moral lawgiver. And the teleological argument, which we're looking at right now, argues from design to a designer. So the, the, right there, those are important. When we talk about originally the cosmological argument, it's making an argue, argument from existence of the cosmos. We were here. We have a universe. The universe had to come from a creator. Right now we're in the teleological argument, meaning there is a design here. There had to be a designer. It sounds very similar. Point three, the teleological argument points out that all things aim towards their destiny. Seeds grow into plants. Projects are started for the purpose of achieving a, a completion. Journeys begin with the destination. Everything is reaching towards completion or towards the design, thus telios. Again, there's a design. Everything we do, we, we, we don't go on a trip without having some kind of a plan. You don't build a chair without having saying, I'm going to build a chair. Uh, unless you're a child playing with Legos and you start snapping things together and you start waiting to see what it looks like, then you call it an airplane. And I've seen Tyler do that. It's like, but he has no real plan. He's just snapping things together. And sometimes he does. But nonetheless, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about logical thinking. I'm not saying Tyler's not logical. I'm just saying Tyler's just playing with Legos. Um, <clears throat> the journey or of the acorn is to the final cause the oak, of the oak tree, but setting this goal, this destination aim plan, was not set by the acorn. Since the acorn does not have a mind, intelligence, in, 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 intelligence is needed for the, for the causes to begin. So in other words, an acorn grows into a tree, true, but 
who created it, who designed it that way. There has to be someone that created that process, and it continues on like that. Uh, point five on page eight. We're still in the tele teleological. Aquinas, Thomas Aquinas, calls it the governance of the world. Every agent in nature acts for an end. This is Thomas Aquinas. We're talking the Middle Ages. He's, he's thinking, this is be way before modern, this is way before the Renaissance, way before anything that we'd call modern science. You know, they still are, at this time, still thinking uh, the, 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 the sun and the universe revolves around the earth, if you would. Uh, they may be still struggling with if the earth is flat around. That's, so, I mean, we're way before what we'd call modern science. But he says, every agent in nature acts for an end. Things in nature exist because of some other cause. These agents are acting out things like survival, eating, or reproduction. Action for an end shows intelligence. Agents are moving towards an end or purpose. Often the purpose is bigger than the agent itself. So you look at the animals. If they're just going out and surviving, they're getting ready for winter. They're reproducing. It's like they're just animals, but they have a purpose. They, they, they're focused on something. Something had to create that design that, that gets them moving. And, of course, the whole universe functions like that. And that's what he was talking about. Again, this can get real boring or deep, but you can see it just, it just keeps going. It's one say, well, this is getting monotonous. Exactly, because it just keeps going and going and going. We don't have one idea or two ideas. We just, we've got thousands of years of concepts that just keep proving this. Over. We're talking about the cell. We're talking about an eye. We're talk, we, just keep, we talk about every phase of nature. You talk about the seasons. You can talk about the plants, the seeds. Number six, the watchmaker argument of William Paley in 1743 to 1805 used the example of finding a functioning watch in an empty field. Now, you've heard this before, but this is the first time it was known to have been recorded, this, this example. This discovery would cause you to logically assume there was a watchmaker that had made the watch. You find a watch in the field. Look, I found a watch. It just is. Well, no, if you actually think about it, this watch probably was owned by somebody, was probably set at the right time at some point, but someone at some point had to have in their mind, I want to make a watch, found the, the parts, put the parts together to create the watch, and made the watch, watch function. And so the watch indicates it was put together for the purpose of keeping time, spring to create motion, the wheels to transmit motion, the brass wheels to avoid rusting, the steel spring for longevity, the glass cover to protect and view. Those were all things that the designer had to put into it. Now we're talking about a watch. We're not talking about the universe. We're talking about a watch. The world indicates greater design and purpose than a watch. The world is greater than a watch. The world is more complex than a watch. The world vastly variety of ways to adapt to reach a specific end. Notice the watch has got the spring, the wheels, the brass wheels to avoid rusting, the steel spring for longevity. All those things could have been used by something else, but they would not have worked. Same thing, the world has things functioning. Something else could have had it, took its place, but it would not function as well. Therefore, if the existence of the watch implies a watchmaker, the existence of the world implies an even greater intelligent designer, which would be God. That is those things right there. All these things, being, time, cause, space, are all saying we have space. Someone created the space. There's cause functioning within this space, which means there's a thought there. There's time ticking away in this space where the cause would take place. And we have beings like me, talking about time, watching time, aware of time, with a cause, trying to get to some place within this space. Well, I'm an agent doing these things, but it, I'm not the sole purpose of the agent. Someone else outside put this all together. And, if you, and the thing is, you're going to have to, in my mind, you're going to have to get weird to explain that any other way. You're going to have to get into some kind of strange illusions to explain it other than what really seems to be happening. The clock is really ticking. We're actually measuring time that is passing with a clock. I'm actually thinking and expressing, trying to communicate. You know, my voice is traveling. These things are actually happening in reality. Well, that's just the way it always is. It's like, no, it's not always like this. This is something that was created. Uh, we go on to the next thing, very quickly. The next argument, these are the basic arguments for the existence of God. Now again, we saw intelligent design. Uh, we saw the classical argument teleologically. We saw cosmological. Now we've gotten the moral arguments. 
the use of the existence of human morality as proof for the existence of God. And again, we've already talked about morals, so we don't want to repeat ourselves too much here, but there are morals. Well, let's just read this. Once again, there is the classical moral argument and the contemporary moral argument. The classical argument is something that was they used for years, and then they've updated into more of the contemporary, bringing in some new issues. We'll watch the classical moral argument first. It's based on the comparison of humans to minerals, plants, and animals. So you've got this group called humans, and then we just have this other group we'll just call animals. And you've got other things, uh, you know, like it says right there, minerals, plants, you put plants in here. And there is a difference between plants and animals and humans. Humans, they can recognize wrong. Animals, they just do what they're supposed to do. Plants just do what they do. They're designed. Animals are not going to have a conscience. You, don't, you may you know, kill an animal because it's violent, but it's violent because that's the way it's trained. That's the way it is. People try to talk about humans as if they're animals, and there is a simulation. I mean, we have a body, we have a mind, we can, be, we can train animals. We talk about behavioral science. I use it all the time in my shop. I can train a dog. I can train a 12-year-old just because they're an animal. But there's something more in the human than just behavioral science. There is morality. And so there is a difference. Again, don't, don't not try to talk down people here or children. Um, but nonetheless, yeah, I, and I will. I will say this. I'll even push this even further than I should. This goes back to my argument about raising children 0 to 12 and 12 to 18. When they're 0 to 12, they're, they're basically in control mode. You're behavioral science. You're not talking to them in the moral, logical communication. As close you get to 12, the more you begin to do that. But as a two-year-old, you don't reason with a two-year-old. I don't want to say this in a negative way, but like you train a dog is how you train a two-year-old. You put in some kind of a system that they learn their behavior. They learn what's right and what's wrong. You teach them these things by repetitive behaviors. Then as they get to be 12 to 18, they separate, and of course they get to 12, you know, you're, you're letting off on the basic training. Now you start to communicate, let them make more decisions, make mistakes, say right and what's wrong. Here, 12 to 18, as a parent, you're no longer dealing with an animal me mentality here, and I'm not saying children are animals. I'm saying here, you now can talk to them logically. I know, I know, I know, you have dogs at home, you talk to your dogs, and you think your dog is like, yeah, okay, that's, 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 whatever. But you, the 12 to 18 year old child, you can logically talk with them. They have, they can respond, they understand what you're saying. They're not just thinking, treat, treat. Uh, you know, that's why you think what you want to think, but you can logically talk to a child. I don't think, gosh, someone's going to get mad. It's more, you're more, more scared about offending animal lovers and pet owners than animal Muslims um, because they could become more violent. Um, <laughs> But here you can talk to a child because why? Because of this. Because they're not animals. They're humans. They've got a soul. There's a sense of morality, and you can begin to reason with them. Try, I mean, try reasoning, making a deal with your pet dog. Uh, try, oh, try reasoning with a, with a cow. Try reasoning with a deer running in front of your car. Excuse me. If we could just have the highway clear between five and eight o'clock while everyone's driving to work, can we kind of get? You're gonna to have to go back to this. You're gonna to have to go back to behavioral training. You know, put a fence up. You know, put some kind of flashing lights. You can't go out and have like just let's just get the deer together and talk with the deer. We can be logical about this. There's room for everybody. They're an animal. You can't do that. Now try talking to the plants. You can talk and reason with the human. That's where this is going. Uh, uh, plants grow into what they were designed to be, and animals behave in ways for which they were created. They grow and act in accordance with their nature. And you, even James says, every animal can be trained, but you can't train the tongue. Because he says that, now that's, that's on, you can't train the tongue is connected to something else. It's connected to a soul with some kind of its own view. You can train animals. He says all kinds of animals have been trained. But no man can train the tongue. This is James talking. Because that's now you're tapping into some, not behavior, you're talking into some kind of a soul. Out of the, out of the mouth, the heart speaks. And you can't train that. That's what it's thinking. That's James.
Mankind, point B, mankind is unique among God's creatures. Humans have free will and rationality. Humans can choose to act in accordance with God's intentions for our nature or in violation to God's intentions. God has intentions for animals and they behave in that way. They can be trained, they have a behavior. Mankind can actually rebel and not be what God designed them to be, not do what God, they can just, what, you know, this is the whole transgender thing. You're this, you're a male, I'm going to be a male, a woman. You, you, can't, you don't see animals rebelling like that. If they're, they're, if they're male, if they're female, they are. They, they don't, they, why, why? They don't have the same kind of a soul that a human does. A, soul, a human soul can be changed, perverted, it can re begin, to re begin to rebel, and they're the ones who are going to think about switching their gender or things like this. We were, to we were created in God's image and are told to be holy as God, meaning we can be, I have an ideal of what is right and what is wrong, and our goal is not to be better than the animals, our goal is to be holy like the Lord, which means we're going to fail, but we continue to set that before us as a goal. A man can choose his own direction, attitude, purpose, or action in agreement with God or in disobedience to God. Man is capable of refusing God's design, the teleos, and behaving in disobedience to God's design plan. This is called sin. This is what makes man a moral creature. Animals do not sin. Animals are just animals. Man can sin. This is what God, this is what makes man a moral creature. The lack of his this ability is what makes plants and animals amoral by God's design. These are there's no Jesus did not come to the, go to the cross to die for the sins of the animals and the plants. Now all creation is suffering because of Adam's sin. Out of, we know this in Romans and other places. But Jesus died for the sins of the world, which will have an effect on the hall of creation. Because when Adam sinned, his sin affected all of creation. The animals were just part of the curse. When Jesus Christ restores it, that curse will be removed. It has nothing to do with the animals and everything to do with man. In fact, God himself became a man. Uh, oh, what am I looking at here? Page 9. Since man is like, okay, humans have certain perfections they are attained to in their lives. Okay, let's go with this. Perfections. Uh, there are perfections in a person that, that people have. We'll just say put this word perfections because this is. And again, that God is perfect, but we have a reflection of the perfection. God is holy. We are to be holy. We'll never be perfectly holy. God is God is truth. We are to be true. Tell the truth. Now. There is levels of our perfections. We have an ideal. We'll never attain this level of truthfulness, of being true. But we do know that on this scale, we are somewhere on the scale of truth. And so there are these perfections we're looking at right here. These perfections, or goodness, holiness, righteousness, are revealed to man's conscience, soul, his mind, his understanding, in two basic ways. You, you recognize these perfections... General revelation, you know this. All mankind knows this. It's in, it's in nature. Truth revealed by nature through creation to all mankind and received by reason. Reason. And this is why you can live with pagans. This is why you can live with humans of a vast variety of theological backgrounds because of reason. There is some basic things... That's why we can have a we can have a government, we can have a church within a government. The whole government doesn't have to be the church because all man has reason and they can recognize these perfections revealed by God in nature. All man sees them. The next one is they're revealed to man by special revelation. Revealed. Now this is what separates the Christian from the pagan. Now, we have a Christian culture, a post-Christian culture, where the revelation, the scriptures have left an impact in the cultures, even on the pagans, because there's standards that the church brought about. If it's, you know, uh, you know, I remember how they used to have Sundays. You know, you used to have the stores were closed on Sunday. Why? Because of natural reason? No, because Christians had to influence the culture. So this revealed revelation can influence the culture, but it comes from Christianity. But nonetheless... 
we can we can participate in a in a in a Gentile government, Gentile culture, because we have this in unity. This is what I was writing about in Hope for America's last generation. We're not trying to get everybody saved. That's another whole issue. We're trying to save the culture. So for again, please understand, we're talking about America as a society. I don't say forget Jesus Christ, forget the ministry of the church, but that's not going to save the culture. We need the culture to come back to reason, some basic institutions that God has revealed to all men. We can all agree on what I thought would be these basic things. Individual responsibility, marriage, family, uh, government, nationality. These are just, if we can all just work together on that. Well, what about Jesus Christ? Save that for another day. Save the culture. Pray. What about ministering to the world? We need to save the culture. That's what Paul tells Timothy. Pray for your leaders, your kings, that you might have peace. Why do we want peace in our society? So we can be about the Lord's business of the revealed revelation. If we're fighting for survival, if we're in the midst of a civil war, we're, we're, we're trying to survive, not have church, although there's certain God can work in every situation. We want to establish normalcy so now we can begin and or continue to evangelize the pagans in this reasonable culture. Paul had no trouble walking into Greece or Greek cities and speaking. They had a system based on reason of order. He could walk in. He could even go to their philosophers on Mars Hill and speak and reason with them and bring about, lead them in revelation to, of Jesus Christ. Now, if he walked into a war zone... He's not going to be able to walk in and begin to use reason and lead to revelation. Nonetheless, God reveals these perfections to mankind, what is right, what is the, the true perfections, naturally, but also through Scripture. And that's what's being said right there. Um, contemporary moral argument states that if God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. But since objective moral values do exist, God must exist. The contemporary view of all of these things and this is, what, this is what's happening in our culture. If we can say, if we can find this, and this is an apologetic point, if we can find this basic moral standards that, that the Democrats and the Republicans, the Muslims and the Christians, the atheists and the theists and the deists and the pantheists can all say yes, this is right. We should be individually responsible. We should honor marriage. We should recognize family. There should be a government that is in charge of our, of our communities that we all participate in. And there should be nations. I mean, we should have borders. We each have our own nation. We don't need to kill each other, but we will be a nation and take care of our people. Yes, we agree on this. That's, that's what we're shooting for. But when this, when you begin to lose this, uh, this begins to deteriorate, you're, you're, in, you're in trouble. And that's the contemporary argument. The argument we would present to an organized culture is how can the Muslim and the Christian get along? How can the Democrat and the Republican, how can the atheist and the theist all come together and put their kids in the same school and function together? Because there is basic morality. There is a God that created everything. We're not even talking about the scriptures. That's an apologetic argument, and we can't, and you've seen it happen. What we've got happening right now is major rebellion to this logical reason because we're in a postmodern culture. We're destroyed. We're not even taught. Forget scripture. I, I mean, I'm not forgetting scripture. I mean, we're seeing the destruction of logic, of God's general revelation, just being eliminated all the way up to individual responsibility where individuals are switching their sexuality and being cheered for doing it. It's like, how brave is that? It's like, what? I mean, it's like you're destroying nationalism. You're destroying government. When I say the government, the authority the government has established, like the police force. Nothing's more brave than to come against the police. I mean, you destroy the police, like everybody says. You, you, you destroy the police department, and now you need to call someone for help. Who are you going to call? And all the way through, you destroy marriage, you destroy family, you destroy individual responsibility. Now all of a sudden, we can't. We now that argument's gone because like we can't even appeal to. Well, everyone has the same common values. It's like, oh my gosh, we've completely dissolved. And so 
that doesn't change anything, but it does make an effect on how that argument works here in our culture today. The final one of the four classical arguments, the ontological argument. Other arguments for God's existence, uh, motion, contingency, perfection, first cause, personal experience. Uh, ontological, that is the ideal of, of truth, that there is truth, and it becomes a little more complicated because what is truth, and they say that their truth exists, and this, is very, this was something that was used in the Middle Ages, but it's really lost some grip, some, some footing in our culture, but the ontological argument that there is some kind of truth uh, similar to morality uh, uh, or the being, in this sense right here, that the basic argument would be like this. And again, it's, it sounds kind of weird, weak, but down here, if in creation you can think of and say, I know, I can see, I can imagine there is absolute truth, or I can imagine there is a God. We have the concept of truth. There must be truth. We talk about God. Every culture, and listen, every culture has the concept of God. At some point, they've got some concept of God or gods. And the ontological argument is basically saying, and it, it's more developed than I'm going to be able to do here, that because we are, if we can think about this, and every culture has, that means there must be a God that we're looking for. We've got a word for it. We've got a concept for it. We all have some kind of religious system that we're trying to please and honor this God or gods or whatever you call them. And to say, well, there is no God, it's like, that makes this whole concept ridiculous. Then why is everybody talking about it? And so you've got to come up with some explanation of how, where did this concept of God come from? And if you don't say it came from the fact that there is a God, you've got to now come up and say, somehow, every culture throughout history has come up, and usually they say, well, they try to explain the unexplainable, they try to explain lightning, they try to explain tornadoes, they try to explain, and they just came up with this concept, what we would call God, or a higher power, and it's no more than the invention of man's mind. Now that would be a modern explanation. The, the ontological argument is the concept that since we're looking for this God, since we're looking for this truth, it exists out there. Again, kind of a weak argument. It's not nearly as strong. Some people even just throw it away. They don't even use it because they think it can't stand up. Okay, there's other ones, like I said, I mentioned there that go down the list. And again, you can just imagine motion is an argument. Because things are moving, who began the first movement? Again, you can see how this can, this can go on and on and on. Uh, proof. Uh, uh, here's what I wanted to get to tonight, and we're just going to scratch the surface, we'll see. Uh, the options for deity. Now, there are different options for deity. We're going to have, you've got a chart there, uh, reality. And there's going to be basically seven concepts of deity. And I'll, I'll try to get through them very quickly because it's, it's not that important, it's just interesting to know. And the one is going to be that there is one God, the Creator. Some would say there's many gods, or there's plural gods, and then some would say there's no gods. This, of course, would be an atheist, and that ends the question. What, who created reality? There is no God, no further discussion. There are many gods, and that's going to lead you down to this concept right here. Of one of, it's going to have to be, are they finite, just of this world? You know, they're in this world, powers within this world? Or are they infinite? Are they outside of time and boundaries? And that is the many gods. Now, if you look at that chart right here that I gave you, what we have right here, this is called, this is one of your options, atheism. You can choose to be an atheist. The reality you live in has nothing to do with God. Now, you're going to have to explain it, but it's not God. There is no God. Okay, go with that. Choose. Now, it would be nice if you came to that conclusion logically which means you're going to have to defeat all these other options. You say, well, that's stupid. Well, intelligent design is not stupid. There are scientists that are saying, they're dealing with the very fact that they're saying intelligent design, there is some kind of pattern, some kind of language here that makes these, the DNA and the cell function at the basic level. It's like a language, a, a thought, a pattern from somewhere. It's from an alien world. 
<laughs> okay, well, then the question is, but we don't believe in a God. Well, then the aliens, where did they come from? You, you still, uh, well, that's a stupid question. No, that's not a stupid question because you can't just have things causing something. Something's going to have to be the first cause if we have a cause at all. If you're going to say alien life caused the intelligence we see in our creation, then where did the alien life? We can say, well, alien life caused the intelligence we see in our universe. Okay. All right, I, I won't argue with that. But you've got to explain to me where did the intelligence of the alien life come from? Well, are they finite? Are they infinite? If they're infinite, are they God? Are you, are you calling God alien life? Because that would be a true statement. He's from another dimension. So are you talking about God? It's not one dimension. Okay. Over here, you're going to have, if there's many, that's called polytheism. And that would be like, for example, Alexander the Great, the ancient world. They had many gods. That's why Alexander the Great can come to the Jews in Jerusalem and they came out and says, God has sent us to you. He goes, sure, what's his name? Not a problem. I'll put him on the list. And he just accepted everybody's God because he went into the world, conquering the world, believing in polytheism. I mean, the Greek gods, the, the pantheon. And you're, well, sure, I bet there's another one. Even Paul addressed in, a, in a Athens, he says, ah, I see you've got a statue of the unknown God. Meaning, you're polytheist, but you do realize we don't know all of them. And so this is the one we don't know yet, and we don't want to make him that. Now, are they finite, made of this world, or are they infinite? And the answer usually comes down to that they are, they are finite. They are not infinite. They're not outside of creation. They're part of creation. They're outside of creation. They would be some kind of a, a, you know, a transcendent being that created all this. They're within creation. Now, the other option is that there's one God. Now, here's what's going to happen here. The one God. You can be atheist, there's no God. You can be a polytheist, where there's many gods. And most of the time, you're going to end up with many gods within creation. This right here, for myself, is a Christian view of the polytheism. That's demonism. That's, there are many gods. There are demons. They're manifesting in our world and misleading people. And wanting, they all have a, it's a big pantheon. Rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Maybe. Okay, the one God, you're going to go one of two ways with this, and you can see right here, are they finite, or is it, again, one, we're talking about one God now, or infinite? Finite means they're of this world, and that's going to give you two groups right here, the panentheism, and panen means all in God. So panentheism is all is in God, as if God's this big bubble and everything, we're just living in God. Uh, and that's that the song, Stairway to Heaven. When one is one and all is one, that's, that's pan, panentheism. And then there's this thing called, if God is, uh, another option would be Godism. And that's the concept here, that God is limited in power. He's, he, there is a God, but some, for some reason, he's finite means limited. God is limited. He, there's a, maybe a, a flaw within him or some kind of power outside of him limiting him. But God is finite in his control and work in the universe. So pan panentheism, all is God. We're all is in God. And here I what I wrote, panentheism means all in God. The deity exists in everything. And you can see this popping up in New Age and some of the Eastern religions. But notice this right here. See this term right here, finite? That's another way of saying idol worship. Because idols are, remember Paul talked about worshiping man, beast, things created in this world. Finiteism, it, it's finite, it's, everything's going to be in here. This is finite, polytheism. This is finite, these are idols. I think demons manifest here in the form of an idol. Come over here, if you go to infinite, they're going to be infinite. You're going to have this one where infinite means it's, there's no limits. Pantheism is all God. All things are made of God. The universe is a manifestation of God, a universe of God as God. So that's notice the difference between panentheism and pantheism. The difference mainly being finite or infinite. And then here we're hustling through this to get through this. Now we come over here, the big ones. Finite. This would be uh, oh excuse me, yeah, infinite. Let me go over panentheism. And we're going to come down here and go into this next word is transcendent. Transcendent meaning God is outside of creation. 
Creation is not over here. We've got two choices. We've got deism and theism. Both of these say creation is not God. Over here, you're going to be putting, and here, pantheism, you're going to be putting God and creation in the same pool somehow. Either creation is in God or creation is God. All, all is God. So this is all these things. But if you go over here where you're transcendent, where the creation is an identity of its own. Now again, it's got the creator's fingerprints on it. It's got his design in it. But the universe could blow up and God would still be God. He's not affected by the universe. Here, if the universe blows up, you have a problem with your gods. Here, if the universe blows up, you've got a problem with God because God blew up. Over here, in transcendent, deism and theism, the universe, God was fine before the universe. If the universe and all people just disappeared and ceased to exist, God would be fine. Deism and theism, because God is transcendent. Deism, Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, these guys were deists. Not imminent, meaning he's not involved in the creation it, it, currently. He does not act in time, no in the inter, intervention from God, no, meaning no miracles, which means no resurrection. I mean, that's, that's just, that's not, the, that's like a big point for deism when you attack it, is there's no revelation, or there's no resurrection of Jesus Christ. But that's not the only thing. There's God is just watching if he's even doing that. He's not, you, you don't really pray except you just worship him. He's God. But it's not going to have any effect on anything. Maybe your attitude. But he's just God. He's not going to part the Red Sea. He's not going to answer your prayers. It's, it's not even in his nature. He is transcendent. He's outside the universe. So that would be a deist. That became popular around the time our nation was being founded, and it's kind of fallen out of favor. And there's still some around. Uh, what are those, those, those churches, uni, uni, Unitarian churches? But that, that's kind of like, that's not real popular. A lot of things aren't popular. Atheism is real popular. Uh, Panentheism is popular to those that are just New Age and don't really know what they're talking about. Uh, deism is around, but it's, you just got to transcend God. Then if you've got a God that is infinite, no limits, transcendent, outside of the creation he made, but it's also the word there is eminent, meaning he's involved, and you can pray and he'll, inter he'll intervene. He will, he'll move in history. He'll control the flow of history. He'll raise nations up. He'll bring nations down. He'll raise leaders up. He'll bring leaders down. He is actively functioning you know, you're functioning, but he's also functioning in the universe, in the world, in your life today. That is a theist. And you have a one God, infinite in the sense that he's not limited, transcendent in the sense that he's outside, unaffected by the universe, having it created, but yet here can also imminent, he can come anytime into the universe and is actively involved. You can pray to him and he can answer your prayers. He can raise Jesus. He can become a man. See, that's why Thomas Jefferson had to cut up all the New Testament verses about Jesus and his deity. Anytime Jesus talked like God, sounded like God, or was giving credit for me, God, Thomas Jefferson cut that part out and made his own. It's called the Talmud. You can buy it. The Thomas Jefferson Bible. There's no deity. There's no resurrection. There's no supernatural. You just have a great man with great teaching, great morals, living. But he could not have Jesus coming out of the grave. He couldn't even have Jesus being born, God born. He couldn't even have Emmanuel because that would make God eminent. And so you've got a thief. So you've got atheism, polytheism, you've got panentheism, godism, pantheism, and then deism and theism. And when you get to theism, that's where we have Christians, Jews and Muslims are theists. Isn't that interesting? You're closer to the Muslims in your religion as far as the theists than you are to the deists on this, this skin again. Thomas Jefferson was reading scripture, cutting it up like he liked it, and he was adamantly against Islam. I mean, they, they did not like He had trouble with Islam, a lot of trouble. Whole story about didn't have him go to war over there. Uh, his trade was being interfered with Islam. So these guys all dealt with Islam. But they're still in our camp as far as being a theist. So there you have your choices. Uh, choose wisely. Those are the choices you're basically limited to. You say, well, I, I'm, not even, 
I'm not interested in I don't, I, I'm not involved in that. Yeah, you are. You are here. You, you just may be there by default. It's like, well, I just don't even think about it. Okay, here, are you here? I mean, you like, you like the song Stairway to Heaven? I like the song Stairway to Heaven. I try not to think about the lyrics. I, I, you know, I, I like the whole song. But they're definitely panentheism. John Lennon's, imagine. That's, that's atheism mixed with a little bit of this pantheism where all is God. You know, it's like the same thing. Uh, it's kind of weird. It's kind of some kind of combination there. I, plus, make some LSD in with it. Uh, mm -hmm. You can come up with a kind of, you can combine these categories and get some drugs mixed in, which is also idol worship and demonism. Uh, so anyway, one God who's out, no limits, outside the universe when he created it, but yet also involved in the universe, we have a theistic God. And that's where we're at. That's where we've got it. Again, these things are all approved, and the debate can continue. I'll stop talking right now and we'll pick some next week. If you want to know where I'm planning on heading next week, Oh, I didn't get all those information there. I got more information written down by each of those there. It's on page 11. This is what I'm going to do, and I'm not sure how long this will take. I can maybe knock two or three out a week. But on page 11, point B, God's nature challenged. And so now, all these other religions that talk about my God, I believe in a theistic God who created the universe and is involved. Whoa, whoa, he's involved? He is eminent? He can intervene? Yes, he can. Well, then... How can God be loving and just? How can God be a good God and send people to hell? How can, uh, or is God male or female? How can God be as tolerant of sin? Sexism, he's racist, he's legalistic, he's violent, he's genocidal. How can you have God, how can you defend your God? Well, you say, well, we don't have to. We just, we just do what we want. You have to. If you're going to be a true witness, you're going to have, when they say your God is genocidal, you're going to say, well, what do you say? Because he did, your scriptures, just like I'm critical of the Quran, if you are a Muslim and you're going to act and follow the Quran, you're going to have to behave a certain way if you're going to be a true Muslim. Same thing if you're a Christian, you, your Christianity is hooked up to the Old Testament where God sent Israel in to wipe out the Canaanites. What about this? Well, you know, and then you get all kinds of wimpy answers. But if I believe the integrity of Scripture, I believe it's true, I believe it's accurate, I'm going to have to explain why did God send Israel in to wipe them out. Now, he, did not, he clearly did not send the church to wipe out nations. But he did send, my God did send Israel in to eliminate the Canaanites. Well, okay, you're already backpedaling. I'm going to have to stand here and say, God, just like, you know, God did give rules in the law of Moses for slavery. How do you treat your slave? So God's in favor of slavery? Well, for some reason, he gave you guidelines for slavery. I'm not saying he's in favor of it, but he, or those verses like we just went through in Ephesians. You know, masters, treat your slaves this way. Slaves, be obedient to your masters. Whoa, whoa, is, are they, is he pro-slavery? Well, he talked to the slaves and explained, and what are you going to do with that? You don't have to say he's pro-slavery, but you've got to say he wasn't burning down buildings because they were slaves. He, he dealt with it. He worked with the system. So we've got to explain these things. Without backpedaling, without we got to stand, and we've done all the stand. We've got to stand firm. We're right out of you know church on Sunday. I'll pray and we're free to go. Father, we thank you again for the chance to look into these things. We ask that you would stimulate our hearts and our souls to think clearly, to not make up things and, and over exaggerate the statements, but allow your truth to penetrate our hearts and be able to come out of our mouths and out of our lives be able to present your light to other people. We do thank you for the evidence you provided. We thank you for the confidence that we can have that you are the true God and ask that we again would be able to stand our ground firm in our souls to believe in you and proclaim your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, there's no class tomorrow night. Thank you for your time.